Happy Easter. Um, it's a, uh, it's very, um, it's, it's such a beautiful day, uh, it's such a beautiful time of year that we get to celebrate the resurrection of the Lord. And I think the thing, when we come into Easter every year, um, we know the story, right? Jesus had his last supper on Holy Thursday, he died on Good Friday, and then the tomb was empty on Easter morning. So when we think about it, like it, sometimes familiarity can hurt how much we reverence a moment. But I think today, if we really, if we lean into today's feast, that this, this is much more important than just a rock being moved and a tomb being empty. I think in a real way, like God has revealed his plan for us through Jesus. And I think it, sometimes we can kind of remove ourselves. Sometimes we can kind of distance ourselves from the feast that we celebrate. But today's feast is so close that it's uncomfortable. It's so close and means so much to each of us sitting in this church today. Each of us as baptized Christians, that it's so close that it can be uncomfortable. A couple of years ago, as a, as a deacon, um, our class, when I was still at Notre Dame, our class was able to go to the Holy Land. Uh, it was a beautiful trip, amazing. We got to walk in all the places where Jesus walked and did his thing. But every time we would go visit a site, what would happen is our tour guide would give us kind of a heads up. He would say, okay, look, there's a traditional site, like where people used to go and venerate these certain activities. Then there's kind of like the science tells you that it probably happened here more or less than there. And then there's like a scripture that says what thing, when things happen and where they happen. So there was always these three kind of sources that were coming together that may agree or disagree. For example, um, if you go to the Holy Land, I don't mean to spoil it, but uh, when you go to the church that people recognize the wedding at Cana, it's actually about five miles away from the actual site. Cana just moved, so we, we, we had a little joke with our class calling it fake Cana. Um, but, so there's th these different things throughout the course of our trip that we kind of came to see more and more and more. Science, tradition, scripture, all kind of agree, though, on a certain sites. At the same time, you have a lot of different faiths going on. We've got Christians, we've got non-denominational, Baptists, the evangelicals, right? We've got Orthodox Christians. We've got Catholics. And we're all kind of disagreeing at times on the holy sites around the Holy Land. For example, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the place where they basically build the church around all of the main sites, Calvary, the tomb, basically where everything was, they built a church. And they have it on a very, very uh, detailed schedule of when people can celebrate their liturgies at what times. Because there's a lot of disagreement around these things. I found it was interesting, though, that during the course of our trip, we made sure to point out the disagreement at every single place we went. But the day we celebrated Mass at the tomb, the day we celebrated Mass on the tomb, in the space where Jesus, where this moment happened, the only thing that our tour guide could say when we walked out, he looked at us, we got all huddled together, and he looks at us and says, after everything else, the tomb was empty. Like after everything else, after all of the, after all of the disagreement, after all of the different perspectives that look at this mystery, the number one thing that all of them agree on, the tomb was empty. And we hear the account, and we come to celebrate Mass, and we come to dive into the mystery of the tomb being empty, that a dead guy was there, and two days later, three days later, some people wake up, and he's not there anymore. And no one moved him. That the tomb was empty. I think what happens a lot of times, we can look at this, and like I said, familiarity, we can kind of be a little bit like, oh yeah, and a little bit flippant when we read it, oh yeah, that's a really cool story, I get it, that's nice, but what does it have to do with me? Well, I know for myself, in my life, if I look back, there are certain spots of sin, of struggle, of pain, of hurt, 
that I've kind of sealed off. Like if we if I associated with the with the three days that we just celebrated, it kind of looks like a Good Friday. I might have been hurt. Well, we're just going to bury it, seal it off, and I don't need to worry about it anymore. In your life, it might be addiction, divorce. Let's just seal it off. And you know what? We don't have to touch it. We can just walk past it as if it's a grave. We can just drive on Highway 1 right past it and just see a bunch of graves. It's fine. It's an afterthought. I think in our lives, a lot of times what we can do is we can take a struggle or some kind of, some kind of hurt in our life and just bury it and seal it off. But when we look at today's feast, when we look at today's uh, solemnity that we celebrate, when we look at today being the central moment of all Christianity, God doesn't want to leave the tombs empty. I mean, doesn't want to leave the tombs full and sealed and hidden. God wants to empty the tomb. The Second Vatican Council talked about Jesus as this trailblazer. They use this language of him being a trailblazer, that he goes first and shows us the way that we are called to walk. Well, how do we walk? Well, we come to, we come to the celebration of the Eucharist, Holy Thursday. We have our own struggles in our life, Good Friday. But there's a resurrection that God has promised each one of us because of today's celebration, because of today's mystery, because of Easter, that we're called to let our tombs be opened and be resurrected. In our life today, God is calling us to let him in. And as much as we might believe that we've got it hidden and perfect and it's in a dark corner of my memory and my past that nobody needs to know about, guess what? God knows. There's a uh, story that a priest friend of mine talked about. He was with a spiritual director one day, and he said, like the spiritual director looked at him and said, man, like you have stuffed all of your junk. Like if you imagine a house in like that hall closet that nobody goes into. Like you have taken everything, all your memories, all your hurt, all your pain, and stuffed it there in an attempt to hide it from God. And he said, the interesting thing, though, is that you're... Like, that's how you think, and that's how you're feeling. It's locked. It's got, like, chains around it. There's no way that someone's going to get into that closet. The problem is, the, the spiritual director continued, he said, the problem is, is that you're a, you're a house without a roof. And God already knows what's there. He just wants to be invited in. You see, each of us, each of us during this time, I think one of the things that we do as Catholics really, really well, we do Lent really, really well. We love giving stuff up. Last night after Mass, I ran to the refrigerator and drank me a good Diet Dr. Pepper. And it was glorious and proof of the resurrection. But there's, we do Lent really, really well. Like we do a good job of giving stuff up, of praying, of saying I'm going to go to Mass, of I'm going to do these different things. Like we do Lent really, really well as Catholics. But what I think we do sometimes is we miss the fact that the resurrection happened and we're an Easter people. That God's healing power, God's resurrecting power is strong enough for your junk and mine. That he wants to leave every tomb unsealed, open, and resurrected. You see, that's who God calls us to be. God calls us to be resurrected, to be healed, to be full of his life, his energy, his Holy Spirit out in the world. We are an Easter people. Our Lord has risen. There's a joy that's associated with that. There's a peace that's associated with that. There's a hope that, guess what, this world is not the end. That by his resurrection, I'm called to be resurrected as well. Today, we come to Mass to be fed by our Lord, 
to receive his Holy Spirit anew, and yes, to be resurrected. When we walked out of the tomb on our, on our pilgrimage a few years ago, I remember walking out, one of my classmates was just standing there, kind of praying, kind of like letting a whole moment soak in of what we just did. And there was this, this thing that was just, I was convicted of. On my way out, I looked at him and I said, we're the resurrection. I like, we're the, we're the body of Christ walking out of the tomb today. I think for all of us, as we come to communion, as we come to receive the Lord, and as we walk out of the church, we're the resurrection. We're the presence of God in the world. We're the ones that we're called to be God's hands and his feet and his word. So today, as we come to receive communion, as we come to Mass, let us recognize that when we're sent, we're sent to go and be the resurrection in a dark world, to be the light of Christ to a dark world, to be a sign of hope to a world that seems pretty hopeless. We're called to be the resurrection. We're called to have ourselves healed, ourselves resurrected. We're called to go out and proclaim the faith that we hear year in and year out. May God be with you as you go. May God continue to bless you this Easter season. And may we, and may we do Easter as good as we normally do Lent.